Hey, I'm Krista Wax. You're listening to MSP Sound on KFAI. And I have the one and only Martin Zeller with me. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Hey, so uh, we're, I mean, this is a very exciting time in the Martin Zeller world right now. You have a new album coming out. Ah. Yeah. I mean, it's been 11 years and I mean, honestly, it's a feel a little like Rip Van Winkle. I mean, just, I, this business has changed like unbelievably since the last time I put out an album. So my learning curve was really high. I thought, you know, I had it sussed out after so many years doing it the old school way, but man, it's, it's there, but it is exciting and it's as much work as someone that does what I do has to do it. So there's a lot more work than I'm used to. Okay. I know that was my question was going to be, is this harder or easier? It sounds, I guess, a little bit harder this time. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm generally lazy. It's like, I, I, I really am. I, uh, I love what I do. I love playing. Um, and I, I mean, I don't mind this at all, you know, doing interviews and stuff like that, but I'm not used to a schedule. I really am not used to a schedule at all. So maybe that's the hardest part of this is knowing I have to cue to a schedule. And probably being on a little bit. You got to be on and ready to whatever. Maybe that's not an issue. Maybe that's my issue, being on. <laughs> my issue is like when people want to do them in the morning, Ooh. I'll always say that's that's a bad idea. If you want, if you want lucid Martin Zeller, then you had better, uh, it better be after 10 a.m. And that's like pushing. <laughs> so, I mean, and if you're talking 10 a.m. Martin Zeller without coffee, then it's my last vice. And oh my God, I don't know how I get by without that one. <laughs> so there's different level, different levels at different times of Martin that's. Yeah, I'm. I'm at. Well, what are we at? Like four twenty. This is this is my wheelhouse. All right. (laughs) I'm awake, but I'm not already getting tired. It's perfect. (laughs) Right. It's a really good time. Um. So well, wonderful. I'm glad I did not schedule this earlier, although you would have said no. But here we are. No, 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 that's. I'm a Minnesotan. I would have said sure. (laughs) Yeah. It just wouldn't have been good. That's true. That's true. Um, well, yeah, I know that's a Minnesotan way. Absolutely. So let's talk about Head West, the new album. So when did, was this an album you'd been working on for a while? Or was this something that you started during the pandemic? Or did it end up being a panda? How did the pandemic play into all this fun stuff? <laughs> uh, completely. I mean, I had honestly reached a point where I wasn't even sure I would ever put out a new album. Uh, and it just, again, going back to everything changing, it's like, yeah, there's, there's no financial incentive to do it. I mean, there's no, there's not that that's what this is about, but it's not cheap to make an album. I'm not one of those like youngsters that has a computer and can, you know, make it on my so it's not cheap so it, it, it's always like well can i do something better with this money and like and we've got a, we had a late life baby and now you know i'm just turned 60 and so it's like that's always in my head but i don't know and then i think another thing for people like me is especially with the gear daddies it's really hard to crawl out from underneath that it's you put out new music and there's just a lot of people that just want the old stuff, period. And I, I understand that. I mean, nostalgia is a really powerful thing. And, you know, the Gear Daddies are almost more popular now than we were when we were a real band. And I mean, and we're not a real, I love playing with the guys. We love one another dearly. It's like, it's it really is like a family, but we are, a legacy act, which is now the euphemistic way of saying an oldies act. 
legacy act. Oh. And, it, and it's true. I mean, but at the same time, we don't want to, I don't ever want to do another Gear Daddy's album because you're messing with those memories. Mm -hmm. And Martin Zeller that wrote those songs back then and would never write that kind of material again. And I think people expect a Gear Daddy song is going to sound like a Gear Daddy song. But I am just could never write those songs. Anyway, I just thought, yeah, why? Why? I put out another album. I always write, but I always, I've always written. I'll always write for personal reasons. It's like kind of my way of working through stuff and releasing it is always the hardest part for me. Writing it's the easiest part, but like letting it out there into the world. But sitting there over COVID was like, I've never had that much uninter uninterrupted time to sit and think and read and play guitar and and it I think like a lot of people I did a lot of you know you're sitting around and it was awful I mean obviously COVID was awful but there were some there were some great things for me and that I've not got to spend that much time with my family uninterrupted time with my family it mean in year I mean ever mm -hmm. um so that was nice but, you know you just sit there, your head gets cleared and you're and I mean, where we lived, at least, things were quieter. There weren't cars out. There weren't airplanes. The It was just like everything just sort of got quiet and did just a ton of thinking. And I did a lot of reading, which has always been something that kind of kickstarts the creative process for me, maybe even more than listening to music. Um, so I just, all of a sudden, COVID sitting around just, these things started just popping up and memories and then memories that like turned into thinking about where I wanted to go. And, and so all of a sudden it was just like, Oh, Oh yeah, no, I'm writing songs that I want. I, I really want to release and they're not COVID. So, I mean, in what, what would a COVID song be, <laughs> I guess, but it's like, the COVID, those that COVID shutdown was is really responsible for the album. I think probably for a lot of artistic material that came came out of it. Well, that's good. That that like you have Overlining, that I guess. <laughs> yes, because here we are. Here we are. You're at the end. The end of it. <laughs> it's almost like you don't even. Well, I think you just don't. You want to put it behind you, but it's. It's like a much more serious version, I say, of Minnesotans. You can almost freeze to death. And then within five minutes of being in warm, you know, you, you forget that you went through this like really awful experience. You just want to put it behind you. And it was, I mean, for a musician, for me, uh, it's like I lost my livelihood. Um, I lost the thing that brings me, you know, the most joy other than my family and I lost my friends because my friends are my bandmates it's you know I almost all my the people I hang out with are my bandmates it's a, those are my friends and so you know I kind of lost for a couple of years there lost all these really important things in my life but again I found some silver linings as well that's good. Well, it's important to find those silver linings. So it was it's a weird time. It was and I'm usually not very good at that. I'm usually not a, I'm usually a half glass uh, empty kind of guy. I'm not so. <laughs> so these songs are all written primarily you know, during the pandemic and recording. Were you recording this at home? Did you set up a home studio or do you have a home studio and just kind I, of there? I have, I had, we just finished it like less than a year ago, a really beautiful studio in our back garden. Um, and I've been doing this for so long. It's like, I've got all this gear that's accumulated. So all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, I've got, you know, all these mics and all these instruments and all this gear. I mean, and the, now the, the processors, the main thing, 
are so cheap. You can buy for a thousand dollars. You can buy this processor that does more than a hundred thousand dollar, you know, board and processor did back in the day. So that was the cheapest part. So put together this really beautiful studio and then came to realize I have no idea how any of this stuff works. And I, I still don't, but luckily I have, uh, sons that do so this was really a family album and not like trying to be cutesy let's get the family it was just like we were all there my sons are amazingly i mean brilliant kids but and then my our our oldest son wilson is like a savant on guitar so we're all just sitting there you know alone and it just it it's just so serendipitous. The whole thing, studio got finished. We were all there together. Um, I had all these songs that had suddenly come to me. And these all were like independent of each other. Like it wasn't like a linear thing. It's like just just happened to be building a studio. Um, just happened to have everyone together. And just that all happened to coincide with this sort of burst of songs. So I this album just felt like it was meant to be. But yeah, I mean, I don't think I'll ever learn how to use that stuff. I'm always gonna have to, to have someone to do it. I I don't think I have any interest in learning how that probably just a lazy way of saying it. like I'm not I don't want to do it, but <laughs> that's all right too. You have people who can help you. Well, yeah, it's it's family for me. And it was on in my uh so our youngest son Owen is just like a tech was it too and is uh did a lot of the Wilson mixed master engineered mixed and mastered the entire album and Owen uh acted as assistant engineer for the whole thing and also acted as the principal engineer for most of the vocal tracks most of the vocal tracks were just he and I sitting in the studio and then we have a very very late life surprise baby so Wilson just turned 31 and our daughter Clementine just turned 14 so we had to get her involved I mean she I mean so she came in and played did some percussion on a song and then my wife is a seriously gifted photographer and she did all the album photos the front and back cover and inserts and everything so it really was a family affair but everyone was super qualified to do it oh and wilson that wilson played every guitar track on the album every single one i did acoustic demos sitting there you know with an acoustic guitar and singing and then he took those and kind of replicated my uh rhythm parts and but made them played them away quicker than i could and made them sound better but he he played below his skill level to try to like match my rhythm parts and and for me it's like i'm losing the cartilage in these fingers and so it's like the repetitive nature of playing in the studio is really it's almost impossible so that was fantastic and wilson is just incredible guitar player i mean yeah i don't it's nuts so yeah i mean it is, it was, and Nick Ciola played all the bass, who's played all the bass on everything I've ever recorded. He also was Wilson's godfather. Um, and uh, Randy Rotten from the Gear Dice played quite a bit of pedal steel on it. Okay. Um, Allie Gray, who sings with our Neil Diamond thing, came in and sang. And uh, Scott Winham, who I've been playing with for years, the drums. And I went down to Austin, Texas for a week and had uh, three different players down there at mandolin, lap steel, pedal steel, and this vocalist who ended up doing a duet with. Wow, that's quite the crew. Yeah, no, it was, it, you know, it's pretty, overall, it's a pretty small number of people to have contributed to an album. If you look at the credits on a lot of albums, you're talking 30, 40 people is not in the least bit unusual. Um, and even if it's a, a real band, it's 
very common, like a, a set band, a four piece band. It's not uncommon to have, you know, 10, 12 other instruments, you know, mandolinist or a, a pedal steel or a keyboard part or cello, you know, uh, horns. So overall, in the it's a, it's a pretty small group of people that contributed in our, but a very, very tight knit group. I mean, especially the Minnesota gang, it's like literally family or like Nick, he is as close to I me, mean, he is family. And these other players who I've known for 25, for 25 to 40 years too, so yeah, it was a very tight knit group that made this album. That's incredible. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a this was the yeah, it was a very special album for me. It is a very special album for me, but making it was I mean, I so over overwhelmingly gratifying. I mean, it was just one of the greatest the greatest musical experience of my life for sure oh that's wonderful and, and i played the blooming prairie home kind so oh. you know that's that's no little thing no no that's not that's a, people, a feather in their cap like that most people they can you know they can rest their laurels on just that so not you you're not doing no. that nope i keep pushing for a new a new hill to conquer yes which is where we're at i feel like that's where you're at i mean now the album's done and now it's time to celebrate right oh absolutely this is the <laughs> this gets to this is the well i should say this usually this is the fun part but making this was fun for me which is honestly i've never liked being in the studio to me it's like repetitive and it kind of just you're playing something over and over you're singing something over and over and it takes the spontaneity out of it you you start getting a little robotic overthinking what you're playing instead of just playing away and there's no instant gratification you know it's like you play live people clap you know you did something you know you don't you did something that made people happy or they liked you get a check at the end of the night. It's like there's instant gratification, like for these, for every other. But being in the studio, it's like there's no feedback. It takes a lot of time before it starts to come together, and you can really get an idea whether it's you're loving, liking it or not. And and but this time, so every other time, it's almost a recording's been a necessary evil, so to speak. But this time, it really was like a an amazing experience start to finish well that's good and now i mean well we can talk about the upcoming release show they are sold out everyone so don't they're about to sell out two yeah, nights there's, there's 15 seats left for the friday night show which is the second show added oh my god started with the saturday that sold out very quickly so we're luckily we were able to work with the parkway to get the, a second show on the front end but yeah there are 15 seats left get out there get out there how how does that feel for you to be like okay i'm gonna do this i did this album i recorded it i'll do you know hometown release show sells out like that and a second show added almost sold out how do you feel after all that that's i can uh, tell you how i feel for you i'm excited for you i take nothing for granted i honestly don't it's like i know it's one of those old cliches that's like we have the best fans but i really do think like the gear days must have the most loyal fans and look at this that band put out two albums two albums how long i mean when the last one was put out 30 years ago um and we can still sell out first avenue you know however many years later on the, on the basis of two albums that are that old i mean that's a loyal fan base and i again it's I, we were talked about this before we started taping but nostalgia is a really really powerful thing 
as it is for me. I mean, music, hearing a song that, you know, was like, I still, if you, if I hear Del Shannon's Runaway, I am right back to sitting, you know, in my bedroom in sixth, fifth, sixth grade, just like absolutely blissing out over it. So yeah, music, nostalgia is a very, very powerful thing and with music especially, but so yeah, these you get people coming out to the Gear Daddy shows, and you can tell they're just reliving these these college memories or whatever are coming back, and they're so happy, and that makes us very happy. And uh, I mean, yeah, and just that since going solo, I mean, I've been able to do this for a living. I've not had this. The last job I had was overnight stocking shelves at Target in Roseville, so. That's been a long, long, long time. I've been able to do this and nothing else. And that, if you told me that, you know, again, when I was sitting in fifth grade in my bedroom listening to Del Shannon, someday I would get paid to make music at all, that people would come see me play, that I get paid to do it, that I would succeed, you know, let alone like that I'd be on Late Night with David Letterman or I'd be written up in Rolling Stone or those things they were just blown it been like no you know those things happen to people in new york and in la they don't happen to people in austin minnesota you know from austin minnesota so i honestly i don't take anything for granted and it's like we we had the one show booked i wasn't expecting that to sell out like let alone sell out that quick I, so and then when we had the second one i'm like oh i don't know if we'll be able to and and honestly I think it would most, I mean, of those 15 seats left, they're all single seats. So it's kind of hard to sell those tickets anyway, sometimes. So no, it's, it's, it's amazing. That's, that's so exciting. And so, so people don't be, don't be sad if you didn't get a ticket, you're still doing, there's, I feel like I've been seeing a lot of announcements of local shows coming up that you're performing and you're also going on a little tour too. Yeah, been a been a while. Well, it'll be a series of tours. Uh, we're starting out doing the Midwest stuff, but then we're just playing our way down 35, uh, just doing Austin and Dallas, Texas, and then Lagrange, Texas, because there's a an amazing little singer songwriter listening room there that I really wanted to do. And then we're just doing Phoenix, LA, and San Francisco, flying home from there. And then we're going to do the play our way out to the Pacific Northwest, like out what through there to Denver, and then hit Portland, Seattle on a separate tour. And we're just we're doing Des Moines, Kansas City, Omaha, Chicago, Milwaukee on another little tour. And then I'm saving the East Coast for after winter because I. Touring the East Coast is, the logistics of it are really tough to begin with, but in winter, it's not something I want to tackle. And I, I'm i in no hurry, you know, this is just, promoting this album will be a, you know, a, a year long, you know, minimum endeavor. I, I'm not trying to just like come out of the gate. I just, I don't have the financial or even inner, the wherewithal inner, energy wise to do it you know like try to plow come out of the gate and just keep going so it's going to be a a year-long process okay so many opportunities see you perform <laughs> yeah go to, if you go to my website especially uh you know if you get to if you're out on the east coast oh yeah if you're out on the east coast we're doing two shows in san francisco the bay area um but if you go to my website, it's it's incredibly gratifying because I don't get out uh, out outside of the Midwest very much. And so, you know, the last time I did it, I'm like, ah, oh, no one's gonna show up. And we had crowds in every market. It's like, wow, people still know who I am on a national level to I mean, not like they do in the Midwest. And to be frank, you know, we show up in Phoenix place is packed 
and thinking really like, wow, man, I'm big in Phoenix until I find out everyone there is from Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, or the Dakotas, like all these transplanted <laughs> Midwesterners that have all moved to Phoenix. So, but I, I mean, I'll tell you what I can get. Yeah. It's a following. Well, following is still. <laughs> Following's a following. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. So the album, okay. So Head West is coming out. By the time this airs, it will be out. So people can stream it. Are there physical copies, CDs, vinyl, or what's yeah. happening? Yeah, there are. I mean, there's another way. You know, the industry is just like, I don't know what the hell is going on anymore. It's like, I have to ask the press, like, do people buy CDs? Should I be even pressing CDs? Or what do you call it? Burning? I don't know what you do with CDs. But, and for the dem my demographic, there are people that still buy CDs where if you talk to my sons, they just roll their eyes like, what? And like, no, we don't. And, uh, but vinyl too, really cool vinyl. It's a, the artwork is this beautiful California shot that my wife took. And then the vinyl is a matching like sky, marbled cloud, sky blue vinyl. So it's a really cool vinyl package. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, streaming on all your all this whatever they are the streaming services <laughs> all streaming i'm an old man ah! like, it's just a lot there's a lot going on in music i mean who would have thought you'd be like we're streaming we're putting out vinyl and cds still like those are some mainstays it's yeah well, everyone thought vinyl was gone gone right i just was talking about that with someone this was someone else like trying to figure out there are people that have bought uh, Gear Daddy's albums on when it first, well, when Let's Go Scarell came out, it was only vinyl. So people have bought Let's Go Scarell on vinyl, cassette, CD, downloaded it, and now are streaming on it. So it, it's on its fifth, it's on its fifth format. Wow. And none of these were small, you know, it's like, I mean, I think it came out on the micro tape or whatever, too, but I'm not even going to count that. But we're talking five very real musical formats that it's come out on, and there are people that have bought it. And I'll, I bet I bought The Clash. I bet I bought uh, I bought London Calling on every single format for sure. So, I mean, you got to do it if it's your favorite album. And then the vinyl, I mean, I love vinyl and it's so nostalgic, but I just, I don't, I can't take care of it well enough. And <laughs> it's like, I'm not, they always end up with, and then you have kids and pets and I don't know. I, I don't like, again, not to be the old guy. The one thing that really drives me nuts, well, as a songwriter, you don't get paid anything, but you know. Say la vida, it's just everything changes. But uh, I don't like that you don't own anything. What One of the things that drives me nuts is there's no artwork. Yeah. Um, no one knows all the people that played on the album. I mean, I, I remember just, I would sit and listen to Born to Run with that dual full album. I could to this day tell you every person that played on that album, I could tell you the name is manager. I could tell you his label. I could tell you his booking agent. I could tell you every, I could tell you almost everyone he thanked. It's like, I just sat and studied that. And now, you know, people may know it's a Beyonce album. They don't know who wrote the songs. They don't know who played. They don't know these incredible musicians that played it. They don't know these incredible studio professionals that made this happen. They don't know, you know, the people behind the scenes, the management and everything. That they don't, they don't know any of that, and that's what's kind of, I mean, plus the artwork. God, album artwork was so great, and then you know it got reduced to the smaller with CDs, but still, it was something. And now, you know, just not having any of that. So that's I, I just miss not having something to hold, and also that, you know. It, it, the whole world goes to hell and internet disappears. We're screwed. We don't, we don't own, we don't own any music. 
right <laughs> i know i miss looking through like album artwork and the photos and oh. ooh, if they had lyrics in there it was always exciting because yeah. then oh i definitely know the song now i got the cheat sheet right here yeah i mean seriously it, it it was all right there it was like a playbill with with everything in and also alba the album format mattered. It's like now it's all singles. It's just singles, singles. And I was one of these, I was a kid that like, it was the B-sides that like usually grabbed me. The last songs on an album, there's there's a vibe to what you put artists use as their last song. It's usually moodier. It's usually longer. Um, those Those last songs were some of my favorites on most of my favorite albums. Now it's like there's, you know, there's, you know, a lot of them you don't even hear any of those deep tracks because it's all about singles. But again, everything changes. I'm not, you know, it's, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'll say, like, I, I know what I miss and it, it bums me out. But the, the, the business changes. The business has changed always. Yeah, it does. Lots, lots, a lot of movement, a lot of things happening. Well, yeah, radio. You would, you would know as much as anyone. I mean, look at just what's changed and how music is delivered, how people get their information. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's just. I know. I am. I am surprised how much. Uh, I mean, it doesn't feel like radio can be as relevant anymore, but I am still surprised at how relevant it can be or how artists are still excited. It's fun to still hear that artists are excited to hear their music on the radio. Oh, gee, yes. So, it- Same with print media. I mean, there's something, there's something way more exciting about holding a newspaper in your hand, a physical newspaper hand, and seeing there's your picture there's these words um then so uh then just you know reading it online it's that all blends together i don't know why but you know it's like there's there's a million things online that you can find yourself but back when it was in the print it was like that was something and all those little things the first time you saw your album in a been at a record store was such I can tell you that I mean the first time I heard myself on the radio first time I saw my name mentioned or band's name mentioned in newspaper and the first time I walked into a record store and saw Gear Daddy's album sitting in a slot it was just like those are well and having our song played it put on the CC Club jukebox was a huge one like I think that's is a star on First Avenue. Yeah. Those things are like as big as you know, way bigger than having been in Rolling Stone. You know, that was cool getting and it was cool being on Letterman. It's cool I've had a lot of really cool stuff happen. Um, but nothing that touches those really small moments. Like again, I think it was uh it was KFAI that I heard the first time heard the gear daddies and it was uh garage door where i first saw our our thing and it was the star or, i'm sorry city pages where i first saw our name but all minneapolis memories and those things are what like i said and then hearing myself on the cc club jukebox which back in the day was like you had made it when you're on the cc club jukebox all those little firsts are the stuff that's that really are, are what you just blow you away and that you'll never forget. Oh, I'm sure that's so exciting. A star, a star on the first avenue wall. That's a star. That's pretty major. That's what I achieved too. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 and I mean I mean go back for like that when I was first time I was on the stage at Seventh Street Entry, it was like, I can't believe I've got here. Then next step, getting on the stage at first the main room, and it's like, I can't 
believe I'm up here. And then all, then you have then a star on the wall. It's like, this is just all through. I would have been blown away if I had stopped at the first level. Just if I had to know that I played on the seventh street entry stage would have been incredibly special to me. I mean, if it had just stopped there and the fact that it's moved up to that is mind boggling. Again, for a guy from Austin, Minnesota, that you know, sat in his bedroom, a dreamer, and a kind of a super, super depressed little sad kid, and it was to think that you know any of this stuff has happened is still crazy to me. That's incredible. You've just had such an incredible career, and I just think you've had such a great part of minnesota music history and it's it congrats congrats on the new album and thank you for coming on the show this is just this means a lot too so very much for having me it's great